is uh, exuberant. Is that a good word to use? Exuberant. Um, turn your Bibles to John 17. We're going to hang out there uh, for our scripture reading this morning. I was singing the, the song before this last one, Is He Worthy? That is such a rich song. And I love the line that says, does our God intend to dwell with us? He does. That is remarkable. That there is a God who chooses to love us up close and personally and intimately. He is dwelling among us through his son, Jesus Christ. And that is a special gift indeed. Amen. Amen. Before we read the scripture passage, um, James Delorado is going to bring us the message this morning. And uh, if you weren't here last week for the announcement, we are getting ready. We are praying. We are planning, trying to keep in step with the spirit uh, about planting again. Sozo 2, Missio 2. And uh, James and Liz Delorado are that couple that uh, we have been talking with and praying with about sending out with a team of people to start a new work in central, north central Phoenix, and uh, super excited about what God is doing. And there is no better way to engage those who are disconnected, not only from church, but God ultimately, than through church planting. It is the most effective way to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have known that personally because we've done two church plants in, in our history. Now we're getting ready to daughter a new church. And we have, uh, we have been so overwhelmed to just work with James and Liz and to talk with them and to pray with them. And so we're getting ready to do this. And so last week I uh, announced we're bringing James on at a six-month contract as a church planting pastoral intern, for, for lack of a better title. Uh, he wanted Grand Poobah, and I said, no, that's already taken. Um, but uh, you're going to see more of James and Liz. You're going to hear more uh, from them. Uh, we're going to keep you guys up to speed with what God is doing, and uh, there's just a lot, a lot of cool stuff happening. So number one, keep praying for us because uh, there's one thing that the, the enemy doesn't like, and that's when the kingdom of Christ expands. And we continue to march forward with the gospel, seeing men and women, their lives freed uh, through the love and, and mercy and grace of Jesus. So pray for this uh, endeavor and this effort. Pray for Liz and James and their family. Um, also, if you know of anyone that maybe is in central or north central Phoenix that would love to maybe be a part of this team, uh, let us know. And uh, things are just slowly moving and slowly developing, and we're super excited about this. And so pray for them. The Assessment Center uh, is happening next uh, month in November where they're going to be assessed as a church planning couple. Uh, it is three and a half grueling days where they just look at every aspect of their lives and uh, see if they have what it takes to, to church plant. Um, it's, a, it's an exciting season for us, and, uh, and I mean us right here because you're a part of this. And uh, super, super excited to not only be your pastor, to, but to be a brother in Christ and to say, let's continue this adventure and see what God has in store for us. So thank you guys for your prayers, for your, your giving and your support. Uh, we're using it for eternal purposes, and, and that's what it's all about. So uh, I'm going to have James come on up. I'm going to read John 17. If you have your Bibles open there, um, starting at verse 13, and then I'm going to pray for James. We're going to talk about prayer this morning, the spiritual discipline of prayer. And perhaps there's no better place to go than Jesus' own prayer uh, in John 17 and how he prays for us, his people. And specifically, look at verse 13. John 17, verse 13. But now I come to you that these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. And you have sent me into the world, and I have also sent them into the world. 
And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask in behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the gathering of your people. This is truly a sacred time that you have chosen to dwell with us and to meet us and to speak to us. And I'm super excited to have James open the word before us as we look at this topic of prayer and to not only gain insight into how important this discipline is, but Lord, the gift that it is designed for us to continue to grow in relationship with you. Pray for James, the words, the mind, the heart, that he would be your vessel to share your truth with us today. Thank you for this time, Father. And it's only in the name of Christ that we're even able to come to you and pray. Amen. Give it up for James Delorado, if you would. <coughs> Thank you. Let me raise this thing up real quick here. It's good to be with you this morning, Missy O'Day. Um, and it's really great to be with you um, as a member of the church, of the community this time. It's been, I've, I've come out here probably maybe once or maybe twice a year, once in a while, and we've come out just worshiped or I've been able to, to share the word. But I'm, Liz and I are just really excited to have kind of a home base in general, because that's been a journey for us uh, in particular, but also just to be with you more, get to know you more, and to deepen our relationships. So let's, let's connect, let's talk, let's get coffee, let's uh, talk about life and get to know each other, and that's uh, something that we're really stoked and excited about. Um, we are continuing in Spiritual Disciplines, our series on that today, and we, uh, we've, we've been, this is the one, two, this is the fourth week, okay? So the first week, Scott talked about the intro to the Spiritual Disciplines, setting the stage, giving us uh, wisdom and understanding of what, what is this topic of disciplines, what does it really mean to engage in Spiritual Disciplines, and then we're going through, I think it's about 10 weeks total uh, the first one was the word, then we talked about worship last week, and now we're on prayer this week, and I, I don't even know what's next week, so that's, on, that's in Scott's serving. serving, there you go, serving, so all of you um, who are excited about serving, I don't know, listen to that one, <laughs> um, I was going to say something, but then I was like, I have nothing to say <laughs> clever about that, so just stop, um, this is what goes through the mind of, of us preacher people. Um, so just there's two things. I was listening through Scott, uh, par par part of Scott's messages, and in the intro are two very, 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 very important things. I didn't put them in your notes, but you can write them down if you want. Two very important things that we always need to keep in front of us when we're talking about the spiritual disciplines, and, and Scott set it up very well. Number one is this, that Jesus is our focus in all of the disciplines, right? We come here, we're, we're we're singing the words about Jesus. We are engaging. We're talking about Jesus. We're reading the scripture, a prayer about Jesus this morning. If we don't make Jesus the center of what we're doing in the disciplines, they become an end in themselves. And then Jesus is just the means to get to a way that we can be a great uh, person that is doing things out of our own effort and our own will. Okay, Jesus is the end. Spiritual disciplines are the means to get us there. They are not an end in themselves. Jesus is our focus. Jesus is, our, is the one we worship. He's our king. He's the one we want more of. I love that uh, a pastor friend of mine always say, how do we just get more of Jesus? How do we engage Jesus just to get more of him personally as who he is and what he's done in the gospel? And that's, that's the focus of a spiritual discipline, any single one of them. The second uh, supports and reinforces it, and I quote from Scott's first sermon, God loves desire more than he loves competence. He said that multiple times that day, and that is, again, it reinforces that first point, because he just wants you to want to do any of these things, right? He wants you to want to worship him. You don't have to be perfect at it. He wants you to want to pray to him. He wants you to want to serve. He could do all kinds of things with our desires and our wants and, our, and our, the place that comes from our heart and the deep within our soul. And that is the, the main focus. And, and getting good at it with confidence, 
And we'll read some quotes. We'll talk a little bit about that. I don't think it's even possible. <laughs> and so if we start focusing on that, we're going to lose the, the mission a little bit uh, and lose the focus and the heart of where we're supposed to be at. So those are two things. Jesus is the focus, and it's about our desire, not our competence. <clears throat> now, prayer is our subject today. And society and culture in general in, in, in our American society, especially pop culture, talks about prayer a lot. I think maybe prayer is something that's talked about maybe more than God in our popular culture. Chris Pratt is a great example. I don't, does any, did anybody watch the MTV Movie Awards recently? Okay, Ryan, good job. Okay. <laughs> He's saying culturally irrelevant. Okay, that's, uh, I haven't watched them in a while, but I probably should because they're way different when I watched them this time. I was like, wow, they have round tables and it's like this big um, thing before when it was just kind of a bunch of crazy things happening, but it looks more prim and proper nowadays. So the, uh, Chris Pratt recently won, I forget, I think it was two or three months ago, maybe you heard about it, he won the Generations Award, which is essentially, this is the person that we look to to speak to our generation for uh, um, someone that, uh, that we think has achieved great things. So Chris Pratt, uh, the great actor, comedian, he's, he's, he's hilarious. But he had nine things that he came up, and he says, as your Generation Award winner, I got nine important things, important pieces of wisdom I want to share with you. You can go watch the video. I was going to show it, but then it gets a little off the rails with some potty humor and some silliness. And so, <laughs> but in, interspersed throughout his, his different things, he's got a very uh, God-centered and even Jesus-centered focus to things, even though he doesn't ne necessarily mention Jesus specifically. But rule number six is relevant to us. He says this, God is real. God loves you. God wants the best for you. Believe that I do. And then he says, learn to pray. It's easy and it's so good for your soul. Okay, so prayer is where he kind of leaves it on there. And in just doing a quick Google search of celebrities who pray or others that, that would align with Chris Pratt in some way, shape, or form, you could find Mark Wahlberg, Kevin James, Justin Bieber, Selena Gomez, Stephen Colbert, George Foreman, Carrie Underwood, Manny Pacquiao, Denzel Washington, all of them, probably many, many more I'm not even mentioning, all mention that they pray, which is great. However, what does that even mean is the question that we need to ask. Because prayer can have some different meanings. And in our context, and when we're looking at the biblical context, I think it has a very specific meaning. But when we, when we just splatter it all over social media and, and, and the media in general, and cele people like celebrities are saying, we don't always know. Sometimes it's, a, it's a, uh, a vague notion of prayer or who they're praying to or what they're praying about or the thoughts and prayers generalization, right? Like often that, that is something that um, is said often in our culture. What does that mean? It's a word that becomes so familiar to us, I think, that we can lose the essence of the meaning of prayer. Because as I was thinking about it, I was like, what does it even mean to pray? Where does this word come from? I know we have no other word like it. We don't even use it for really anything else. Prayer is just prayer. So what do they mean? I think an important job of teaching the Bible, if you teach the Bible, if you ever preach, or if you're ever doing anything when you're in a Bible study, try to define terms. It's an important piece of teaching because, again, terms and words, they can take on all these other meanings, and then they all of a sudden have something that we didn't even realize. I'm talking about prayer in one thing, and you're talking about prayer in word, and then we realize we start explaining what we mean. We're like, oh, we're not, we don't totally mean the same thing when we say that. That happens a lot. And so uh, defining terms is, is an important aspect of that. So what is prayer? I want to take a, a minute to do this, and I think this will be fun. So by way of interaction, um, just take one or two, maybe three people right near you, if you're at your table or if you're, someone's right next to you. I want to give us one minute. I'm going to count it down. One minute exactly. I want you to come up with a definition of prayer that is 10 words or less. You cannot use more than 10 words. Okay? So uh, I'm going to start. The, you got your people? Did you look, did you look next to you to see who, who, sit, who happens to be sitting there or who you chose to sit with today? This will be real easy. You don't have to make it a big deal. Or you, you can make a movement over to some people that are nearby. All right, 10 words or less, definition of a prayer. Ready? Go. About 40 seconds. Make it shorter. <laughs> you park, I make it shorter. <laughs> Three words? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Got about 30 seconds. You can write it down if you want. I'm going to ask a few of you.
Ten seconds. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year. All right. All right. You guys got your definitions? Who wants to uh, volunteer theirs first? Yeah, what you got? Perfect. Prayer is praise, talking with God, and asking for help, right? Perfect. Yep, go for it, Greg. Talking to and listening to God, perfect. Yep, how many words? No, that's good. <laughs> you count them out loud. Yeah, no. Communion with God. Nice, get it down to three, yeah. Nice. Prayer is a daily and personal communication with God, right? I like that qualifier, daily. It's consistent. Yeah. <laughs> Prayer is creating an intimate relationship with God. That's, that's great. I love that. Anyone else have one? Yeah. Intimate, vulnerable conversation with God. You guys are beating all my definitions that I found. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, Jacob. Talking and seeking God. That's great. Yes. Anyone else? Anyone got one word? He, what? A privilege. A privilege. He's got two. He's got the shortest definition so far. Well, technically one because, A, I, you know, priv we could just say privilege. A privilege. That's great. A privilege is prayer. Relationship. Yeah, there we go. I mean, we could. Uh, and we got one syllable. Any, one syllable. Of word. <laughs> the highest bidder. I got a gift card to give away for the shortest <laughs> utterance of what prayer is. Uh, these are all great, and I love your answers. And, I, and, um, and, I, and what I try to do, since I had more time with this with my definition, but also because just for the sake of simplicity and clarity, to boil it down to its basic thing, and all of you said it, you added other words that are important to it, and by no means am I discrediting any of them, but um, simply prayer is, my definition, a dialogue with God. And that's what we have uh, for your first, first point there. Prayer is a dialogue with God, and I, something's going down out there, um, prayer's a dialogue with God, it's, it's, it's two ways, it's not just one way, right, it's not just us speaking to him and only requesting, and it's not us just listening and waiting for God to say something and not hearing anything, and then just like, oh, well, I guess I'll just do what I want to do, it's a, it's a back and forth, it's an engagement, it's a relationship, like you said, it has so much about um, that that is important to it. I want to read a few quotes from some popular authors about this, a uh, few short ones um, on this. So go ahead. The first one is this. Prayer is language used in relation to God. It is the most universal of all languages, the lingua franca of the human heart, which is just means the common tongue, the common language of the human heart. Eugene Peterson, Eat This Book is the name of it, which is a great name for a book. Any of these books, by the way, <laughs> I highly recommend. And, he, and Eugene Peterson particularly has a way with words and explaining things that is so rich and unique and artistic and creative. So that's a great book. It's more than just prayer. It's about uh, studying the word as well. Next one is this. Prayer is learned behavior. Nobody is born an expert at it. No one ever masters prayer. And that's John Ortberg from The Life You've Always Wanted, another book about spiritual disciplines I highly recommend. It's learned behavior, right? That goes back to right where we started. It's, it's a constant learning process. It's something we're engaging in, and we don't master it. Next one, a little longer, but I love the imagery that Philip Yancey gives in this one. In prayer, I shift my point of view away from my own selfishness. I climb above the timber line, look down at the speck that is myself. I gaze at the stars and recall what role I or any of us have in a universe beyond comprehension. Prayer is the act of seeing reality from God's point of view. I love that. The last one is from something called the New City Catechism, which is essentially uh, kind of like a confession of the faith. It's a newer one. It's online. I highly recommend reading it. It kind of encapsulates a lot of what we talk about in Christianity in, in a confessional sense. But it says, prayer is pouring out our hearts to God in praise, petition, confession of sin, and thanksgiving. So there's, there, there's many ways we can define prayer, right? The, it's endless. There's so many books on it. And... It's interesting that this that the definition here from the New City Catechism starts adding some other types of prayer into the process. And I thought that was uh, an interesting way to study, too, is to look at what kind of prayers are out there. And you look at a lot of spir spiritual discipline books, you can get exhausted by the types of prayers. For instance, Richard Foster, who wrote a, a great book on prayer that I haven't read yet, but I know it's great. Um, <laughs> but I read his other books, Celebration of Discipline, and there was great things in there. So he has... 
many uh, different uh, points of prayer. He, um, he structures his book by moving inward in prayer, moving upward in prayer, seeking intimacy that we need, and then moving outward, kind of ministry prayer. And under those subheadings, there are things like this. There's simple prayer, prayer of the forsaken, prayer of examine, which is like personal examination of ourselves, prayer of tears, the prayer of rel relinquishment, formation prayer, and covenant prayer. The next phase of the book, the prayer of adoration, the prayer of rest, sacramental prayer, unceasing prayer, the prayer of the heart, meditative prayer, contemplative prayer. We're not done yet. The last part is praying the ordinary, petitionary prayer, intercessory prayer, healing prayer, the prayer of suffering, authoritative prayer, and radical prayer. Okay? And there's probably an appendix that has more prayers in there. And it was funny. I was, I was telling Liz this to Liz, my wife, last night. And she's like, it sounds like you're rattling off Bubba Gump uh, shrimp recipes. <laughs> <laughs> there's a popcorn shrimp and uh, Creole shrimp and barbecue roll it, saute it. So that's, there's your popcorn shrimp. Uh, there's your shrimp Bubba Gump prayer recipe right there. But the, the idea, so we can talk about all these forms of prayer. And they're all very, very important. They're all part of the Christian life. We probably all do them without even realizing that we are doing them. But I want to get down to the essence and more of a specific place when we enter into the word, right? And Scott said this the second week, is the word is really the scriptures, the Bible is the gateway to really all the disciplines. Because if we don't know what God's instructions are for us and who we are, who we are worshiping and who we are called to be like, then we're not really... Um, we're not centered, we're not grounded in prayer. So the word is our gateway. So I want to look at a passage in Luke 18, 1 through 14, and we're going to uh, look at this, the heart of prayer as Jesus sees it. It's in your notes. And the first one is this, a desire and faithfulness for prayer. Go ahead and turn to Luke 18 if you haven't already. Luke 18 chapter, or sorry, 18 verses 1 through 14 is what we're in. We're going to break off, the f there's, a f there's two parables there I want to go into. 1 through 8 will be the first one. The second one is uh, 9 through 14. So Luke chapter 18, verse 1. As you're, as you're turning there, the passage is toward the end of Luke, just to kind of give us context and the setup of it. In chapter 9, 10 chapters earlier, Jesus says, I am setting my face toward Jerusalem. Or Luke says it of Jesus. He set his face toward Jerusalem. It's a major break in the Gospel of Luke where everything that he's doing from then forward is moving toward the cross. He's moving toward his death and moving toward what will be his ultimate victory over sin. And then in 19, we see that he actually enters into Jerusalem. So this is right on the cusp. Ch chapter 18 is right on the cusp of about to enter in in his, in his teaching ministry um, as we get there. Chapter 17, right before that, has Jesus talking to both two audiences of the Pharisees and the disciples. So you remember the Pharisees, we talk a little bit about them today. Pharisees are the religious leaders of the day, the Jewish religious leaders. They held um, the scriptures and the prayers and the leadership in the synagogue. And he's talking to them about the kingdom. And he says in a few verses in 17, the kingdom is already in your midst. He doesn't say specifically him, but that's what he's referring to, is that I am the kingdom and I am here. And he's talking to the Pharisees and they're not totally getting it. And then he turns in some, some way, shape, perform, he turns to the disciples and gives them more information. And this is a passage where you're probably familiar with of what it looks like the second coming of the Son of Man. It's a Son of Man passage where he's talking about what it looks like um, when he comes back and returns and what, th what the world will be like at that moment. So he's talking about the kingdom that is already here in your midst and a not yet kingdom. And that's what, but he gives that deeper inform information to the disciples. And then in talking to the disciples, as chapter 18 starts, he tells them a parable. So look at 18 verse 1. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always, always to pray and not lose heart. And I really like, I don't know about you, I like it when the Bible, specifically a gospel writer, tells me what I'm supposed to know about this thing I'm about to read. That really helps my interpretation process. So he tells them, this is what I'm about to say. This is the point of it. Verse 2, he said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. So right from the outset, Jesus sets this parable up with the judge as the antagonist the one that, we're, that is not really the one to root for, if you're understanding this phrase. The phrase is actually something that was common in Jesus' day outside of even the Bible. Other pieces of literature would talk about um, a person who neither feared God nor respected man as a, as a kind of certain type of person that was on their own. And it's interesting because it's ironic in the sense that he's a judge, so he doesn't fear God, he doesn't fear people. Then where does his sense of law come from? It, I guess from himself, <laughs> because he's just created his own law. He's a law unto himself. So 
we see that he starts to set up, he puts this judge right in the, right in the beginning of this. Verse 3. There was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, again reiterating his pledge of life, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Another character shows up in this parable. It's the widow. The widow, as you may know, is a marginalized person, especially in this first century context. Women did not have rights. They only uh, had rights or any semblance of rights when they were married. That was kind of the ultimate goal. And now she lost her husband, and she's on her own. They don't tell us what the justice she's demanding for here. We don't know spe specifics behind it, but we know that the widow is being set up, as Jesus is saying it, as this is the person who really needs justice. This is the person that is the marginalized. This is the person that you might look at it in society as the one like, yeah, that person really does need help. So immediately he's, he's telling disciples, I think us, who are those people in your society that are, are like this, the people that we may look the other way with. So he, and then, so in the, and then additionally, the judge is basically all about himself. His response is, whatever I got to do, seek my own comfort and just give you what you want because you're bothering me then there you go, there's some justice. Leave me alone, back to my own uh, life, and it's not a priority for him. Justice is not a priority for him. So let's look at verse 6. Verse 6 and 7. The Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. Will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? And he says, uh, first part of verse 8, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Um, I. Howard Marshall, who wrote a commentary about the book of Luke, says this, the point of the parable is the contrast between the judge and God. These are the characters that Jesus brings it full, full circle at the end where he explains it. It's a stark contrast. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, that judge is ridiculous. Of course, God, the God of the universe, of course, um, who we're talking about here, he's going to give justice. He is nothing like this one, the one that is is follows his own way and does not care about the marginalized people and does his own thing, just seeks comfort. That is not like the God, uh, this God of the universe judge that we're talking about here. And of course, he's referring uh, to, to himself, the God, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The next verse, though, is interesting. And Marshall, in his commentary, again, I love this phrase. He says the last verse here, the last part of verse 8, he calls it a sting in the tail because he kind of veers off the parable a little bit and transitions into something else. And, he, and essentially what he's doing is putting the ball back into the disciples' court and to our court. Verse 8, uh, the second part. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Nevertheless, in Greek, is, is the word called pl plain. I think you say it that way. But it's an it's a, it's a adversative conjunction is essentially what it is. Big words. But essentially, it's just saying it's a transition from one to the next. It's like the word but and moving a stark contrast away from, hey, this is what you heard, this is what we're talking about, Th this is what we're talking about in justice and the judge and the widow, but let me bring it even further to you. What about even finding faith that anyone would even pray like this? It's a strong adversity. It's, it's something that's really pushing the point home that Jesus is trying to say, um, be beyond what you may think of judgment and justice, is there anyone that even has the faith to pray like this? So what he's doing is putting people, us, the reader, in the shoes of the widow. At that point, he's saying, hey, are you like the widow or are you like the unrighteous judge? Think about it where, where you are at. And, I, and if we end it here, if we just ended this, this parable here, I think this could, relating it back to what we're talking about in prayer, it could move us into a place where we may heap shame and guilt upon ourselves if we say that I'm not really like the widow. I'm not really like the judge either, but I'm not as faithful as the widow in prayer. I'm not as persistent in pushing forward and what I, in, in uh, pursuing God and praying all these great lavish prayers that we started with in the beginning or doing these awesome things like having this conversation with God in our heart. I'm not really like that. And so in, in, a, in a great way, Jesus pushes that back at us and say, who has the faith, who has the desire and faithfulness to even pray this way? Do you have it? 
So if he left it there, we would be in trouble, but he doesn't. Look at the next verse. Posture of prayer is humility in your notes. Verses, uh, the second parable goes deeper into, into this story, deeper into what Jesus wants us to know about the heart of prayer. Verse 9, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Thank you again, Luke, for <laughs> telling us why this parable is written. Because right there you can see already that if it's about us, and our own self-righteousness, and our own ability, then we're in trouble to be the persistent widow as we should be. Two men, verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. The... (laughs) The drama in this passage is very thick. I can't even imagine walking to a place of, place of prayer and thinking in my heart, man, at least I'm not like that person. But maybe I actually do that inside <laughs> at times, which I'm thinking about it now. Maybe there is a, there's a piece there that we all do in some ways. At least I'm not like, interesting. So I'm not even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I get. So he's doing the right things, okay? These are the right things that he's supposed to be doing. But it seems like, well, let's be honest, it is clearly, in what Jesus is making this very clear in his passage, he's doing it from the wrong motives. His heart's not right in it. He's doing all the right things, but it's all because he just thinks he's great. He's awesome. I'm the best spiritual person in this prayer room right now, in the synagogue, in the city, whatever. This tax collector, he should be going over there because he's just robbing people. But the tax collector, verse 13, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. First part of verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. And then Jesus stings the tail again. For, who, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now we're digging deeper into the heart of prayer. I think that it's it's interesting how these teachings are are paired together, to how one after another Jesus rattles these off to take it another step down into the the humility, the humble heart, the humble posture in prayer. But again, humility, being humble, define our term, right? What are we talking about again? Is it, what, what does that mean? We're not going to do another um, uh, definition, so don't worry. You know, talk to your neighbor. Um, but the, the humility, <laughs> ooh, that was a close one. Um, being humble, what does that mean? What is the essence of it? Now, I have a quote I want to read here. It's kind of long, but it's so rich. Okay, so Tim Keller, he's been a major influence on me. I love uh, his readings and his sermons. He has a sermon uh, that it turned into a short book, and I highly recommend you get it. It's called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. You can get it for like two bucks. It's a great even devotional material. You can probably read it in 30 minutes. It's pretty short. Um, but in it, he is focusing in on many different things, but he, the concept he's talking about is, is pride and humility. And what does it really mean when we get to the essence of what that means from a gospel lens, from a Jesus lens? So in this section that I'm about to read, he is talking uh, about Paul, how he explains him in, in Corinthians that he does not even judge himself. You may have heard that verse. Um, I don't even judge myself. And then he quotes uh, C.S. Lewis. And then this is kind of what launches us off into this quote here. Let's see, can I read it over here? If we were to meet a truly humble person, Lewis says, we would never come away from meeting them thinking they were humble. They would not be always telling us they were a nobody because a person who keeps saying there are nobody is actually a self-obsessed person. The thing we would remember from meeting a truly gospel humble person is how much they seem to be totally interested in us. Because the essence of the gospel of gospel humility is not seeking more of myself or sorry, thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. Next next slide. I'm going to read this whole thing. There's only three slides, so Bear with me. Gospel humility is not needing to think about myself, not needing to connect things with myself. It is an end to thoughts such as, I am in this room with these people. Does that make me look good? Do I want to be here? True gospel humility means I stop connecting every experience, every conversation with myself. In fact, I stop thinking about myself. 
The freedom of self-forgetfulness. The blessed rest that only self-forgetfulness brings. Go to the last slide there. True gospel humility means an ego that is not puffed up, but filled up. This is totally unique. Are we talking about high self-esteem? No. So it is low self-esteem then, right? Certainly not. It is not even about self-esteem. Paul simply refuses to play that game. He says, I don't care about your opinion, but I don't care that much about my opinion either. <laughs> and that is the secret. And I love it because it's counterintuitive to what we may think, right? It's, a, it's a almost paradoxical. A truly gospel humble person is not a self-hating person or a self-loving person, but a gospel humble person. The truly gospel humble person is a self-forgetful person whose ego is, is just like his or her toes. It just works. It does not draw attention to itself. The toes just work. The ego just works. Neither draws attention to itself. Isn't that rich and deep? <laughs> I encourage you to go read the rest of that uh, book. And I wanted to read that whole quote because, it, again, there was so much in there. And I got I to gotta say, I think, well, one, I'll say this. There, I think a good test of where you're at in this, in understanding this gospel humility is things like public speaking. <laughs> I don't know if you've done it before or doing what I'm doing now, is public speaking, you can either go, man, I killed it, I nailed it, or everyone, oh, everyone's engaged. And I know this is so ironic that I'm up here right now saying it, but whatever. You could, you could go through this process of, I did a really great job. And you may be oblivious to how you really did. Or you could say, I was terrible. Everyone hated it. I don't even know. And then we th but here's the thing is we fir the first one we know, that's not humility. That's pride. That's arrogance. But the second one, as Keller is saying, is also arrogance because you're thinking about yourself again. And in a, in a sense, you're kind of doing this thing of, oh, like this false humility thing. Like, I'm going to beat myself down. Let me get ahead of it for you. So because I know you're going to come at me and say something of like this or that. Yeah, you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't that good. And uh, at that part there and, you know, this thing like that. And it's like, yeah, so that way now you don't have to say anything to me. And the only thing you can do now is encourage me. You're like, oh, well, James already beat himself to a pulp over there. <laughs> Let me help that guy up because he really, that's not humility. That's not gospel humility because we're still thinking about ourselves. We're still rattling through our brains constantly. And I, you know, and I'm, I'm using this example because one, I think it is, is public speaking is a major one. And I think it's a big reason why people don't want to do it often. It's one of the greatest, whatever they say, top five fears of, of all people. But I, have, I struggle with this all the time. And, and especially early in ministry, when I started to preach, I started being very fearful of, well, did I do a good job? What does my pastor think of this? Did, what are the, like when I was doing high school ministry, what are the, the kids, are they even engaged? Are they just falling asleep? Parker was there for a lot of it. He can tell you later about it. Uh, but, you know, just constantly self-focused, anxious about whether I'm doing a good job. And here's where I'm, com where I'm moving toward. Again, I haven't attained it this, this week where the wrestle was there. And I was like, well, I should just share my, my struggle in this because this is, this is totally relevant when we're talking about prayer and how I'm engaging the Lord throughout the week because I'm not focusing on humility, but I'm focusing on myself. And I'm moving more toward a place where I can come up to do something like this or do anything at what I'm doing in my life and say, hey, it's about the message. It's about what I'm trying to say. It's about wh what we all need to hear about Jesus and the gospel. Someone's got to do it. Someone's got to talk about the scriptures, whether it's up front or together in a community, and it's not about me. And those are hard to un un untangle. And I'm not saying I arrived at that at all. It's still a struggle, but I think that is, that is the constant struggle, and, I, and that's why I want to define humility in that way, is this thinking of ourself less, just moving back away from, <laughs> back away from your ego. Back, everyone, okay? Put it over there. Back away from it. We all need that. And there's a lot of self-protection that can go on with our ego. And we do that. It, there's a lot of management we have to do nowadays, even on social media, right? We have to manage, oh, like someone did this or someone did that, or I posted this, oh, and then our ego starts running wild. And Jesus is saying, hey, just back away a bit. Just leave it over there and focus on me. That's true humility. And that's what we're seeing from the tax collector, right? He just backs away and says, God, just have mercy on me. He, know, he has a proper view of himself, right? He knows he's a sinner. That's important. But it doesn't mean we just sit there and wallow and say, I can never be good enough. I can never attain it because that's not the point. And the, here's where the key comes in for how we can be gospel humble people who pray faithfully. It's this word justified. Did you see that word in there? Did it, did it ring um, in your mind theologically? Maybe it did for some of you that know some theology. If not, um, the, 
the word justified is very interesting uh, because it's used here. It's typically a, used, uh, Paul, uh, a word used by Paul, the apostle, in a lot of his writings, more formally to talk about what salvation is. Justification is the theological term, okay? And what's interesting about it is it's, I don't think the word, as far as the study I, uh, that I've done and even this week on it, it's not even used in the rest of the Gospels. This is the only time the specific word justified is in there. It's you, the concept is there. The concept is all over the Gospels, but the specific term is not. It's in Paul a lot. Go to Romans uh, chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse uh, 21 through 26. I hope these verses can relieve us of the weight we carry when it comes to prayer or anything else in of, our, of our life. Verse 21 in chapter 3. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, here's a popular verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, as a sacrifice, as atonement, that's what that means, to be, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, in him passing over former sins, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let that, let that series of verses lift off anything that you may be holding. Because here's what I want to get at in the point of this. And, and at the epicenter of what we're talking about in prayer is that you're not going to be good at it. None of us are perfect at it. None of us are perfect of living any of the disciplines, the Christian life. The, the, the way we do it is vicariously. It's through Jesus. It's through the fact that justification basically means that Jesus is stepped in the place for you to do anything. He's taken it off your plate and said, hey, you're going to make a mess of it anyway. You may do a little thing here, a little right there. But again, you're going to come back to yourself. You're just going to think about yourself in it anyway. It's going to be self-focused and self-seeking. So let me come in there. Let me die. You won't understand this right now. Let me, let me let my life be taken by sinful humanity, and let me take back my life. Let me stand in victory, and as I, like, I love what we talked about this morning, the roaring lion declaring freedom. That's what we're talking about here. Our faith and our ability to pray and be faithful and have the desire to do it, to be humble in these processes, we're lost without it. We need supernatural intervention. We need God to come in and take it off of us, put that yoke on him, and then bear the burdens with us. And that, at the end of the day, this, this idea of prayer, this true selflessness, is this, it's a confession prayer, right? Is that, is that what the tax collector is doing? He's praying in confession. So if we struggle with prayer, maybe the first place we need to go back to is just confessing that we struggle with prayer. And do you, know, do you think you're going to get condemned by God from that? No. God, God wants that more. He wants us to get, to get in there and to look down at our own sinful sense and, and nature and say, oh man, this is, I can't even do this. And God's like, great, all right, now let's go. Now I'll take it with you. Now, now learn from me because his yoke is light, right? His yoke is light because he's carrying it all. <laughs> and we get to walk in that process with him. So, the, the next point here is the prayer of Jesus supersedes all prayer. And it's interesting because Scott read a verse from John 17 this morning. And uh, I actually, we didn't plan it, but the Holy Spirit just kind of brought that up because I was going to go into John 17 as looking at Jesus' prayer. So let's look at John 17 verses. I'll read, uh, it's up here. You don't have to go there if, unless you want to. John 17 verse 3, 1 through 3 say this. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. This is uh, the last supper together with the disciples and he said father the hour has come glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to, to all whom you have given him and this is eternal life that they know you the only true god and jesus christ whom you have sent in order to do what die on the cross take back life and give back life to all of us through faith and simple trust and simple release of ourself and our constant 
worry and anxiety and fear over my ego and what people think of me and what I even think of myself. This needs to cause us rest and release and peace and being calm. And so here's what I want to say just in, as we think about this, is that this, if you're struggling with knowing what to pray or how to pray, confess. You can also just read through John 17 because Jesus' prayer supersedes all prayer. Because in this chapter, there is so much that he's praying for. You heard a little bit right now. You heard a little bit of what Scott this morning. It's so rich in prayer and depth. And Jesus already is praying the great ultimate prayer. I'm thankful that we have Jesus praying the ultimate prayer of what he wants for all his saints for all time. Because then we can just go back in and be like, hey, if I'm off course, if I'm just praying, meandering, I don't even know what I'm praying, or I'm just being selfish in my prayer, I don't even know how to do this thing anymore. Okay, well, I want to just learn from the author. Why don't I just go back into the, into the depth of, of what it actually means? Because Jesus is, is, is saying, hey, pray like this, but also know that I, I've already done that work. And I'm moving toward the cross. In, the, in John chapter 18, 19, 20, he moves toward the cross. And that stands as the ultimate and final way that we know how to pray or what we even need to pray um, is that we have this closeness. So at the end of the day, how do we just pray close to Jesus? And how do we have his heart in the midst of that? I want to close just by a few practical things. Um, keeping, again, the lens on the fact that Jesus guides us in prayer. But there's a few thoughts that I had I said, it would be great to share a little bit of my prayer life, and maybe you could take something from it as just practices. So this is prayer and practice, your final uh, note there. Prayer and practice, things that other than what we've already talked about specifically, maybe you can implement into your life. So the first one is this. Pray till you start praying. I talked about this a lot already. But essentially, as we get sluggish, the soul, as it moves away from Jesus and gets bogged down by the days uh, of the week and the world that we live in, we get sluggish. It's like when you work out, right? You haven't worked out for a while. You're sluggish. You're trying to get back into it. You, you, your desire your desire's there, but your abilities, and you're just like, oh, does it go there and do that? Sometimes it's good to just go there, spend 10 minutes, and leave, <laughs> and just, just get in there. Or just put your workout clothes on and get in the gym, and just, oh, I drove here. I came and I left. Hey, you're doing something. <laughs> you're, you got going. I showed up. I checked in on the little beeper thing. I went in uh, in the bathroom, wa- and, uh, and then I just left. So, okay, but I'm here. <laughs> I showed up. I put an effort. And you build on that, right? It's the same thing with cleaning the house or whatever activity we may not want to do. Prayer is, I think, something that we always desire that we want to do, but it's not easy just to implement all the time, and we get so distracted. So for me, I need to pray till I start praying, and that just simply looks like me sitting at a coffee shop, sitting at my house, or closing my eyes and just focusing and just saying, God, I can't pray. I don't know what to pray about. Where do I go? My mind's all over the place. Pray till you start praying. The next one is this, and it kind of pairs with this uh, first one. Closing eyes and the removal of distractions. So closing your eyes and the removal of uh, uh, auditory and visual distraction. In worship, musical worship a lot, what I do is I have to close my eyes because I feel like I'm, I'm very... I'm like over, I'm sensory overload guy, right? Like I get, it, I get riled up and that's why sometimes it, it's hard for me to sit down and write and even school was sometimes hard because I, like, I had to bring myself down. I get all worked up and excited when I'm around people and all this other stuff. And, and then I have to, I have to uh, pull myself back a bit. So by closing my eyes is a practice and sometimes not even needing to sing the words in a, in a musical uh, moment is helpful for me just to remove my, myself from the equation. So, and this goes along with silence and solitude, um, what Scott's going to be talking about in a few weeks. So I won't, I won't take any more from that one. Well, I will take any more, one, one more on that. And this is adapting to seasons of life in prayer. Do you guys, do you guys know what I mean by that? Someone tell me what I mean. What does it mean to adapt to a season of life in prayer? Yeah, no Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think because I think you're talking about the way we engage it, and then I yeah the seasons even pulling it back one step because I think you're absolutely right. That's what I'm getting at, and pulling it back one step is that your life will have different circumstances in those seasons that will cause you to have to pray differently, 
and it doesn't mean that you stink at prayer again. And actually at times, and this is a whole other thing that I would love to talk about anybody with this idea of the dark night of the soul or God purging us or when he seems away from us, is actually a way that God is drawing us closer to him. And, uh, and St. John of the Cross, uh, is a cr- uh, Christian um, uh, contemplative kind of prayer, a um, uh, Carmelite monk from the 16th century, has spoken great things on this, but it's this idea that, uh, that there will be seasons when, when it feels dry, but we're actually closer to God than we realize. But here's what I want to say about the seasons of prayer. What I s- there's a, there's a, when I think about, oh, I really want to pray deeply, I don't know what it is for you, but I think about a season back when I was an undergrad in school. It was about 10 years ago before I was married, when I was at a church, and, thi- and I was just starting out in ministry, and I took a personal retreat up to Prescott. I went into the forest, and I, read the, I fasted for part of the day. I read the Gospel of Matthew, almost passed out in the wilderness. I was like, oh, this is a lot of scripture reading and no eating. Um, <laughs> so but I persevered through it. So... But I was by myself, and I said, I'm going to do this because the point was I'm going back into the fall of the semester, and I wanted to kind of just get focused again. And I had this beautiful time of this whole day. I, I was up there, and then I took another book, and I went and, r- and ate at the restaurant. I broke the fast about 4 or 5 that day, ate at a restaurant, read another book, d- went, drove back down the hill, um, listened, listened to some music, worship music, and just was in, I was in the zone with Jesus. You know, I was in the I was in. I was praying. I was, it was easy because the rhythms were just so, I was just so focused on it. And I came back and I went to a, my friend's, he was doing a worship concert at our school. Um, um, and it was just great. It was, it was a day that I look back and I'm like, that's it. That's what I want to do. But now I'm married. I have kids. I have a lot more things going on. I don't have just the college life that I could be able to do that. And I think this can ruin our prayer if we're not realizing it. Is that you transition from season to season and you just got to say, I don't have time to do as much as I wanted to do before to go away for a whole day or two days or whatever days. Maybe there's times I can set that up down the road and say I'm going to do that. But what does it mean to actually engage the Lord in in a different way in this season? Just take short bursts of prayer, right? Take, I'm just going to go, I'm going to leave the house and go for a walk for 30 minutes and I'm just going to try to pray. I'm just going to try to talk to God. I'm just going to get away from the moment. So all I have to say is there is different seasons and we grow and and, you know, the time that we have expands and contracts to what we have. And it doesn't mean that you stink at prayer. It just means the circumstances can be difficult. So the next one, um, contemplation and meditation in prayer. And I, maybe Scott will talk more about this. But meditation is more of this, I think, what we do in the devotional time where we're sitting, we're, we're feasting kind of on, this, on the word, we're praying, we're really focused in on, on whatever it would be. And this is where I think it, this, this partners with what I just said. Contemplation is taking it with you. That's the easiest way I would say it. It's like dining in or takeout. <laughs> Meditation is the dining in. I'm in, I'm in the moment. I'm, I'm sitting down. I'm feasting. But when I, sometimes we have to just learn the ways of contemplation. Hudson has a shirt on that says something about morning. <laughs> I saw that say. What does it say? Morning. Boom. Hudson gets it. He's only te- <laughs> how old is he? Ten now? <laughs> But that's the idea of how do we take the word with us? And this is why reading the scriptures actually reinforce and grow your ability to contemplate prayer. Because there'll be times I'm going throughout my day and something triggers me and I remember a verse and that causes me to pray and worship in the moment. I'm able to just engage God right there. It doesn't mean you have to be, this is the prayer without ceasing idea that Paul talks about. It's not a prayer without ceasing, head down, eyes closed, complete distractionless. It's just as you're going, you're praying and you're engaging in the moment. And you're even, you know, talking to someone in the moment and praying to God. I don't know what to say to this person right now, but the Spirit works in those moments. He absolutely does. That's, a, that's the point of having God with us all the time in the Holy Spirit. The next one is this, be specific. I have a few more of these, but I'll go quickly through them. Be specific. And this is essentially when you're in prayer to yourse- uh, for yourself, um, Try to understand what you really need in the moment as opposed to what you feel like ritualistically you normally do. Sense yourself in, in your heart where you're at, what you need. Um, I think it's a big communal type of thing because this is something that I appreciate when people will say, hey, I'm praying for you this way, this way, and this way because it seems like this. Or I can explain to someone, hey, I'm in the season right now. Can you pray for me like this? And this is something as we talk about church planning and things like that, I was thinking as we're going forward and, and explaining vision and talking to people, I would ask you guys, find specific things that we tell you or that you feel intuitively as you're talking with us. Pray specifically for those two or three or one thing, whatever it is. Be very specific in that. 
and tell us. Tell your friends, and, and you know, even beyond just the church planning stuff or whatever, in community, tell, hey, I'm praying specifically for you in this, as you told me. That means a lot. And it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect at, again, in the prayer at that. <laughs> it just means that you're paying attention. And you're, pay- and God, and you're paying attention with God. We're focused. Um, and the next one, follow through. But then fail, and then repent, and then follow through again. <laughs> I won't say more about that. I think you get the point. I've, t- I've said enough on it. You're not going to be perfect in it. But try, be active in following through. Realize you're not good at it. And then move on and try again. And then uh, the last two are this. Using a journal. I think, I think there is scientific study that says as you're writing out something, as you're looking at it visually and writing it down physically um, or making a creative piece out of it. I know a lot of people are creative and they like to make collages or some sort of artwork. I, I do that sometimes. I don't have words for prayer in some of my moments. I'll just draw... I'll, ha- I'll find a verse and then kind of do some sort of uh, letter art drawing and a picture with it. And, that, and I go back and look at that. And I'm like, oh, that reminds me of that specific moment because it's exercising my mind in a different way, way in prayer. So journaling and writing things down is good for that because you're reengaging yourself. But it's also good because you can go back and look. And that's something that's been a practice of mine that I try to do even though sometimes I'm late. Like uh, at the end of the year, basically, I try to read through my whole journal from the, from the previous year, see where I've come from and then do a quick journal entry about where I'm going. And my journal entries are maybe like once a month at this point, but uh, other seasons have been more. And sometimes it's like I don't get to read it till February of the next year, but it's okay, I'm just going to finish it. Journaling keeps the track record of how the heart is growing and being sanctified and moving toward Jesus more. And you see, oh man, remember when I struggled with that? Look how far I've come. Practice, write it down. The last one is community prayer. And so the basic idea is don't go at it alone. How are we praying with our spouses? How are we praying for our kids and with our kids and allowing them to pray? How are we allowing other people to jump in in prayer even though we may be the go-to prayer person all the time? <laughs> right? A lot of times introverts maybe want to pray. I've heard that wait eight seconds. <laughs> if you're in a community and you're waiting to an- for an answer, the introverts will typically need at least eight seconds to feel like they need to jump into it. It's not. I don't know if that's accurate or not. I'm just saying that wait longer. Some of us want to jump out. We're more verbal processors. We're going to jump out and do that type of stuff, but we can wait a little bit longer and allow other people to jump into it on community prayer, praying over the phone together, even if it's quickly through email. You can do all kinds of things through prayer. It doesn't have to be in a specific moment, in a specific place. What does it look like to keep the conversation going together? So I'm going to move just to the last slide, Paul, if you want. I want to do something as we, this is be our final prayer. Why don't we stand I don't know if any of you have come from churches where you've had a call and response or more of a liturgical process, but I thought this could be a great community type of prayer engagement where we can pray a prayer of confession, which has a lot of similarities to what the tax collector prayed uh, earlier. So what I'm going to do is let me just read the, um, you see the indented center point that's uh, bold. You read that part. I'll read the top part. And as it'll be this call and response is we pray and ask God um, to in confession to redeem us continually. So let me start us. Lord, we have come to see that our lives fall far short of your glory. Lord, you have given your life for us and poured out your spirit, yet we fail to return your love with all our heart. Too often we are selfish and proud, ignoring you, Lord, and neglecting others. Lord, when we do not truly trust and obey you, we are overwhelmed by self-pity, fear, and worry. In Christ, we are given a sure hope and secure love, yet we follow the false hopes and desires of this world. Lastly, Father, through the redeeming death of your Son on the cross, by your Spirit and through your Word, transform and renew us to follow you with joy. Amen. Amen. Let me let me just quickly close us out in a moment of quick silence and prayer. <coughs> Lord, let us take a deep breath right now to gather our hearts and our minds, our whole soul that is devoted and given over to you because of Christ. And if it's not, if we struggle with that, if we're wrestling with this person of Jesus and this gospel, let us also take a breath to consider you and to consider these prayers and the topic in general that we have access to the Father through Jesus, we could say our hearts to you and you can handle all of it, all of it. 
thank you so much, Jesus, that we can have this hope, this eternity, and that you've, you've laid your life out before us in perfect ways, in the perfect cross. Jesus, we give glory and praise to you. Amen. Amen. Good word. Yeah. Thank you, mm-hmm. brother. Appreciate mm-hmm. it. Uh, real quick, two people share what God has impressed upon your heart this morning. And I've got a little incentive to sweeten the pot for you to share. Tim Keller's The oh. Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. Yeah, I have two copies. Oh, I have, that's great. I'm a book junkie. I'm, this is <laughs> sickness. It really is. Who wants to share? How did God speak to you today? Hmm. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you. There you go. Be blessed. One more copy. Eve. You are. God knows your heart, but yeah, what is it? Is this confession? I don't know. What? Okay. Hmm. Awesome. There you go. I had to save a couple copies for next service. So, for me, two things as I as I'm thinking and you're you're sharing from Luke specifically, that that just remind me to not only desire because that's what the widow desired, justice. And for me, that desire peace, God, I want you more than I want anything else. And I want to be my prayer, but also desperation. And that's what the, the tax collector, right? And the, 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 the humility that he just wanted God more than anything. And there's desperate, right? So that for me, those are the big takeaways. Lord, Lord make my prayers not only desired of you, but desperate for you. And if you want a great book on prayer for you this week, the Psalms. Make the Psalms your prayer book because the word not only fuels our worship, it feeds our prayer. And go to go to David. You know, he's desperate and and desires God more than anything else. So, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for loving us, for giving us this time together. Bless my brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. Bless them as they navigate this road of just communion with you, conversation with you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for James and the message that you have given to to encourage us. Lord, be glorified in our lives, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Thank you.